commitment for our success is it's all about people. It's about our tech. It's, we, we call it our ecosystem. So we've got, we've got a wonderful group of people that have built a great platform over the years. And when, when I say build, we always look to, look to improve technology and process. So it's been reinventing what we've done over and over again. And this has resonated with our customers. We've got a great cloud platform. I'm not going to talk about it too much, but um, I'll let Samuel do that. But it's been a great journey, and um, it's really, um, I suppose, just testament to the uh, great brain power we have here in Australia. Um, we've, we are becoming um, sort of known as a technology hub. There's some great companies that are originating here that are going worldwide. I myself um, uh, was uh, meeting with investors across the US last week, and each time I talked about Sydney, the comment was, um, oh, your headquarters are in Sydney, it must be a tech hub. And I'm starting to feel that we're getting there. We, we, we're sort of getting there as a community, and that's why Elmo is really into supporting this growth here in Australia and taking it out to the rest of the world. So welcome, everyone. Really, really great to see the engagement and thanks to Steve. This is a, a very, very uh, big task to put together the meetup. So really um, appreciate it. Well, so thanks very much and over to Sam. Hi everyone. Hello, so Melbourne, you're back online? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. All right. I promise I'm not touching the speaker anymore. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Cool. Yeah. That's, that's, that's way to do with, best way to do with technology is don't touch it. All right. So, yeah. So, uh, tonight I'm going to give a uh, promise will be a quite, quite brief one from me to talk about how we have been building our platform um, and why I'm going to station at the doctor meet up. And then I'll hand over to this one to get to the meet to talk about more technical stuff and he will also do a demo. You know, sounds scary. Alright, so the agenda is simple. First, talk about who, 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 who we are and then what do we do here and how do we do it. I will quickly skip to who we are. We are Elmo, we are we are listed company. We went ICO last year and then what we do, we provide a HR and a payroll solution. Our target regions are across Australia and New Zealand and we have more than a, hundred, a thousand organizations um, our customers. And the service provide, you can see, I will, I'm not going to read through it, it will take me like 10 minutes to go through all of them, but you can see we pretty much provide the whole from either with ties to our customers. And why I'm talking about this? Because it's important for you to understand the context of what we do before into how we do it. So you can see that we have a lot of products from recruitment to onboarding to performance management to section product. We, the same as many companies, we started quite small. When we say small, like as Danny said, uh, he started with three, three members in the team. I joined a bit later. I've been, been with Elmo for eight years. When I joined, yeah, I started also with a small team. 
So I still remember the good old day that we only have a small team of sit together. You know, we do we we work on everything like command back end, this as uh, uh, deployment server, everything support, and we all really well together. It's a small team. We sit next to each other. You know, what I will do is I talk to the next guys like Jimmy there. Uh, Jimmy, I just some change. Like can I deploy it? Perfect. Then things start to change, right? I'm sure a lot of you here have experienced this or are experiencing this or going to experience this. Is from a small team you start to grow bigger. All right. So when we start to face challenge, we cannot just do a you know face face communication. We start to find that you know whatever change you make on one part, you affect the other part, and you find that the application is grows so big, it's impossible to remain in one code base, right? So I'm sure a lot of you agree. So what, what did we do? We've been struggling with that because like, as I said here, there's too many, too many people on the dance floor to step on each other's toes. So from several years back, we started thinking, how, how to solve this problem. And then we are quite lucky. We were at the right time. You know, some of you remember several years back, you know, it get, getting more and more popular, the microservice and the service. So I believe we found the path. Then from then we start to work on toward. So what do we do? This is what we have before. We have a really large platform, all different products. They all they were all on one single code base. And you know, from the team of like S and five and go to the team now have more than fifty, you can imagine it's impossible for all these people work on the one single code base. So we start to move from the monolith to microservice. And how do we do that? From monolithic to microservice, this graph tell a good picture before everything is inside one circle, right? Up, as you move it toward it, you find that, all right, now we have more small little circle. However, you also see that in order to connect the nodes, you need to draw some line. How to do it? So uh, you're getting the advantage to limited code base and limited structure to smaller scope. At the same time, we are adding more redundancy or actual, we need to put in the actual effort for the communication between these microservices. For this part, I'm going to hand over to Riz Wong to talk about some of these practices we can, we can do to mitigate the risk on this part. Thank you. Okay, so now the boring or interesting part. So I am uh, I am Rizwan Ahmed and system architect at Elmo. Uh, okay, so as um, uh, yeah, so uh, so microservices or uh, you know uh, so what are the challenges of having microservices? Uh, microservices or small services that make up one application, so it's all small, small services. It it is increasingly popular. Uh, but it comes with its own challenges. Okay, so what are the challenges then? Okay, so um, this one, is, uh, uh, oh, I was off to speak closer. I'll just go for it again. So this one is a monolith application in a cluster. So if you uh, if you see here, we have a client, and then um, uh, we have an AWS load balancer, then we have a Kubernetes cluster there, and then we have an uh, ingress controller there. So um, when there is a request from the client, uh, the request goes to the, uh, the load balancer, from there to the uh, ingest controller. And then, uh, I mean, from there, it, uh, it goes to two, two different apps. These two apps are entirely independent here. So, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, we can have, I mean, monolith applications on Kubernetes cluster. We can run, uh, you know, microservices. We can run uh, short jobs. So here, in this example, we have two, different, uh, two independent apps here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, no. Yes, no. Okay, if you can just maybe, okay. yeah, if you can maybe speak up a bit. Right. That's another one for the list. That, that's okay. No okay. <laughs> okay, I'll try to be as much loud as I can. Okay. Okay, so here we have two uh, independent apps here. Uh, I mean, monolith apps. Okay. So. Okay, so now uh, if app one wants to talk to app two, okay, so this is where microservices are coming into picture. So, uh, uh, so before it was entirely, uh, entirely different applications. Each app has different database. A request coming from a client from a load balancer. I mean, based on some host, uh, it gets routed to app one or app two. But now, if app one wants to talk to app two, so this is where microservices come into picture. Okay, so now, now, now this is a uh, this is a convoluted, complicated picture here. So, uh, so you uh, so you can see the request coming to the in uh, ingress controller, and then from app one to app two, app two to app four, app five, app. So, um, uh, I mean, in organizations, initially they start with a single microservice, and then it slowly grows up, and then when the microservices grow up, that's where we accumulate the problem. So, uh, you know, so. Um, when you reach a threshold of say 20 microservices, maybe 50 microservices, that's where you will start to see the problem. Okay, so now if you if you have a monolith application, it's always single point of failure, right? But when you have microservices, so many services you have, so many failures. Okay, okay so now uh, so what are the so what are the challenges here? Okay, so. Um, here, here uh, when we grow more microservices, when we have more microservices, okay, so when, uh, when one service communicates to another service, uh, so what are all the challenges or what are all the problems we have? Uh, we might not have encryption. We have to write our own encryption. Uh, and then um, there will not be retries or no failover. Um, uh, you, know, you know, you will have to handle that. And then uh, when your services grow, you have to handle all those things. No intelligent load balancing. Like if I uh, if I want to route my traffic to app one, uh, you know, if I say if I want to route seventy percentage of the traffic uh, to app one, I can't do that. I can't do that. I have to write the implementation. No routing decisions. Uh, like for example, on the host, if I pass some headers, uh, if I pass some headers, and then based on those headers, if I want to route to a specific app, uh, sorry, specific microservice or service that, uh, that can't be possible. Uh, no metrics, no logs, no, uh, uh, no traces, no access control. Okay, so now uh, if, I, uh, if I say that app four, for example, does not want to uh, receive a request from app two, uh, uh, or app four can only uh, receive a put request uh, uh, only from app one, and then it will, uh, it, uh, it says, okay, I will not accept a get request from app two. So, uh, so these kind of things gets complicated when you start uh, when you start writing. Uh, uh, I mean, those things. Okay, so what is the solution? Use a service mesh. Okay, service mesh is a very recent uh, just concept which is uh, just gaining a lot of traction, just a lot of popularity. Uh, and then, uh, um, yep, we'll go for it. Okay, so what is the service mesh? A service mesh is a configurable infrastructure layer for microservices applications. The mesh provides service discovery, load balancing, encryption, routing decisions, metrics, logs, traces, access control, etc. Usually implemented by providing a proxy instance called a sidecar. So it's called a sidecar uh, uh, implementations. So what happens is when you have a Kubernetes pod, uh, usually there will be a proxy attached to each pod, and then this proxy will be responsible for all the uh, um, all the things before, like service discovery, load balancing, everything. So we will see it uh, just quickly. Okay, so sidecars handle inter-service communications. Okay, so popular service mesh frameworks are Istio, Linkerd, and then Consul. Uh, here, uh, we will talk only about Istio because of the time, so we don't have much time here. So uh, talk about Istio. I'll just try to give a very quick demo about Istio. That's what I'm going to do. Okay, so what service uh, I mean, mesh can provide? Retries, as we talked before, Tracing, metrics, canary deployments, 
So what is canary deployments? So if I want to route, uh, 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 you know, for example, 70 percentage of the popular uh, the, the traffic to a certain app, and then uh, the rest of it to another app based on the weightage, that's called as canary deployments. Intelligent routing, uh, circuit uh, uh, circuit breakers, virtual TLS, etc. Okay, so this is the Istio architecture. Istio has these components. Uh, okay, so here, if you see, uh, you can see this Envoy proxy there. Istio uses Envoy proxy. So Linkerd uses another, uh, uh, you know, sidecar or uh, just proxy. Istio uses uh, uh, Envoy proxy. Here, you can see uh, my various components here. Pilot, mixer, citadel, and then a control plane. Uh, the pilot is, uh, you know, so, so, so all these components, uh, you know, just configure Istio architecture. The pilot is for traffic management, uh, just mixer, uh, you know, takes care of policy check, you know, uh, telemetry. Telemetry is nothing but, uh, uh, you know, metrics, logs, and data. Uh, it just captures all those things. Citadel gives you this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the certificates, and then it's, um, it's all centrally managed by state API. Okay, so let's quickly do an Istio demo. So I have a Kubernetes cluster here. Okay, I will just try to maximize this. Does this help? Okay, okay so cube. Okay, so I have a Kubernetes cluster running on AWS here. Okay, and then. So the Kubernetes cluster, uh, cluster is already running. Then, okay. So to uh, to okay to install Istio, you just go and download. Uh, just I mean, just Istio here. If you can see the, at the top, so you just go and install Istio there. And then, so what we do is we apply the CRDs. Uh, uh, I mean, just uh, I mean using Helm. <laughs> And then uh, we do this Kubernetes Istio uh, install. So, the, so these are all the installation steps. So uh, I'll just quickly run this one. Okay, so now uh, I'm running the CRDs using Helm. And then after that, I have two options here, uh, uh, you know. Uh, so with with no uh, just mutual authentication, with mutual authentication. So what happens is when you enable mutual authentication, then uh, then uh, all the services inside the cluster expect to, uh, uh, I mean, to be mutual TLS enabled. So just to make sure that you know it's all uh, it's all running fine, we will go without this uh, uh, just without mutual one. Okay, so now it's run. Okay, so this is how you run. Okay, so now I have some examples here. So uh, here in my uh, in my project, okay. so in my project, uh, I'm having this Istio here. I'm having this Istio binary at the left. Okay, and then I have a lot of samples here. Uh, uh, you know, so uh, so look, I mean, so a lot of examples. There is a hello world example as well. So uh, uh, there is a hello world example as well. You can just go and have a, uh, you see, there is a hello world example as well. Okay, so I have written a hello world example just uh, just myself here. Okay, so now let's see, so what all the Okay, so, I have these pods running here. Uh, so with two applications, I have this application one here, and then uh, an example application from this. Okay. So this this one, if I can just go here, uh, it is having two uh, containers. Uh, it's having two containers. One is called as hello, and then the other one is Docker. So I have two containers here. If you can see uh, this one, uh, so I have hello, and then a Docker. 
so now i mean what's happening is there is an inter service communication happening here so if you see here from hello uh, from hello i am i am communicating with a docker container just like this so what will happen is the proxy uh, the sidecar the envoy proxy uh, will read this and then it will go and communicate with docker 8080 here and then it will just get back the result here okay so now to show this demo here uh, i will okay so here if you see here each pod has two instances one is the actual container and then the other one is the proxy sidecar so if i just quickly uh, go and describe this one Right board. For example, if I just take this hello, for example. Okay, so if I do here, I will have a proxy. I will have a sidecar here. I will have a proxy, and then I will uh, uh, and then I will have the actual container itself. So our container running on AWS ECR. So uh, so this is our container, and then this is the issue of the case. So, uh, so each, pod, each pod will have two, uh, uh, two, uh, two things. Uh, the issue of memory print is very less. So, uh, uh, I mean, you can just put it across any of so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, okay, so now, uh, if I just go and do kubectr, Okay, so the so when I did the installation before, uh, so these are all the services uh, which Istio enables here. Uh, so Istio enables you this uh, ingress gateway. So this this gateway is the uh, the ingress thing which I was showing in the diagram. So here, this is exposed it as a as a load balancer. Uh, here you can see all the moving parts here. Here you can see Grafana, you can see Citadel for TLS search, uh, egress gateway, galley, uh, ingress gateway, uh, just pilot, and then telemetry, uh, you know, uh, eager query, uh, and then tracing, Zipkin, everything. Zipkin is for, uh, you know, tracing and things like that. Okay, so now let's get this load balancer address here. <clears throat> okay, so let's go and grab this uh, load balancer URL here. Sorry? Uh, I have to go to the settings. Uh, what should we do? I think this will be controlled within the app. Okay, okay. okay. Sorry, but sorry, I was giving a demo. <laughs> okay, so hopefully this works. Okay, so let me go and grab this uh, thing. Okay, so let me do a curl here. Okay, so here, uh, here you can see that I'm going to this ingress controller, and then I'm just grabbing here. Okay, so let me just quickly make a change here. Hello world YAML here. Okay, so here, uh, then here. Uh, let me open the readme there. And then here, instead of Docker, I just put Docker 1, just for example here. Okay, so now uh, let me rerun uh, this one. So this is how you, uh, you know, you create your pods with Istio. So what you do is you use Istio CTL and then you do cube inject. Control C here. Command V. 
Okay. Okay. So now, uh, now my hello uh, uh, just image is configured now. Okay. So now let me go and then run this one again. Okay. So now it says that you know it's not able to connect to Docker one. So so here so what's happening here is this geo proxy is reading uh, uh, this this amicide or proxy uh, is making this intercommunication between the services here. We just go and remove this one here, and then run this one again. Sorry, build it again. Okay, so it's been configured again. Uh, now run it again. Okay, let's. Okay, let me build it again. What's now? Okay, so uh, I have also deployed uh, QCPR get ports. Uh, uh, I have also deployed, uh, you know, Istio's book info uh, this application. Uh, I'm having some product page ratings and things like that. Uh, if I go and then if I just put product page, this will bring me uh, a web page here. So if I go. Go here. Go here, and this is the sample uh, bookmark application. <laughs> Come on. Okay. So this is the uh, this is the Istio uh, Istio app. Uh, this is the Pinfo <laughs> app. This is the this is the sample app which comes with Istio. So I have just I have just installed that one there. Yeah. Okay, so here uh, here we have an, uh, just we have a virtual service here. I'll just I'll just show you this virtual service here. So uh, we have this virtual gateway here. Yeah. So the so this is the gateway here. This is the yeah, this is the ingress gateway. And then uh, this is this, uh, 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 no, you know, this is, uh, this is where you configure all your, uh, you know, just ports. This is the starting point of the port. Okay. So let's quickly continue. Uh, I, uh, I will just wrap this up uh, with two things here. I will just quickly show uh, this metric uh, 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 using Grafana and then uh, using Yeager Tori for this. So let me quickly get it to see. T minus N is PO system. Okay, so let me open that wide. Okay, so here, so here I have Grafana. I have Grafana, and then I have um, uh, I have uh, Yogur uh, uh, Igor Curry. So what I do is I just again copy this one. Grafana. So it's listening on port 3000 here. Yeah. Okay, so this is my Grafana uh, just dashboard. If I go here, uh, I can see my Istio, uh, Istio service dashboard. And then here, uh, this will list me all the, all the ports that is running here. Uh, I'm having my details, Docker, hello Docker, history of policy, and all uh, and all those things. Uh, this will uh, Grafana. 
Asana will capture me uh, the uh, the uh, the client request, the request volumes if something is going wrong, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, for example, uh, our pod is Hello World pod. So, what we do is uh, we go and then uh, you know uh, it's the same load balancer, uh, and then uh, we have uh, you know uh, zero ops here, uh, and then we just go and run Hello here. Okay, so we make a lot of requests like this. We just make some lot of curls here. And then here, if I go here and then refresh, you can see that, you know, I'm getting client request volumes here. So you can see, uh, uh, see the, uh, you can see Grafana data here. Okay, let's go to Yegor Kori. This is the very, uh, very interesting part. Okay, so as we said, when we, when we have more microservices, uh, you know, you know, tracing gets complicated. Okay, so if you have a shallow architecture where we have, uh, you, know, uh, you know, one application, uh, just, uh, uh, I mean, flatly calling only 12 microservices, that shouldn't be a problem. But if, uh, you know, one application calls another service, this service calls another service, this, call, this service calls another service, uh, then, you know, then it's, uh, then it will get difficult for tracing. Then, uh, uh, yeah, so um, uh, uh, we have this tool called this e uh, eager query. Uh, eager query is, uh, you know, eager query is your, oh my God, copies. Finally, okay. So this is listening on one six eight six. One double six eight. There you go. Okay. So here, uh, uh, this service uh, will list you uh, uh, your uh, I mean pod. Yeah, your pods, and then I can go here. Hello, uh, that is my pod here. Find traces. We just minutes before uh, we ran one. We ran this one. Uh, we go here. Uh, this will give me a detailed trace. Uh, this will tell me that hello is talking to Docker. Uh, if I go here, hello. Uh, you know, so this gives me everything. Uh, this gives me everything here. So it gives me the, uh, uh, you know, the component, the node ID. It's also giving me this GU ID so that you can trace with this ID, uh, you can trace that, you know, uh, uh, the further call should have the same GU uh, ID uh, to make sure that that's the same request going on. Uh, you can see that, you know, internally it's communicating uh, uh, I mean, with your container and then with your uh, these things. So this is just an example. Okay, so let's see some complex examples here. So if I go to my product, for example, uh, this, is an, uh, this is an Istio example, for example, product page. Find traces. Okay, so I ran this, you know, five minutes before. Okay, so here you can see, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know. So now you can really know that, you know, uh, this will this will be really helpful for you for you if you if you if you want to know where you are. It gives you use uh, from so this tracing is an amazing tool here, and then uh, uh, this more amazing thing is the way uh, you can uh, analyze your service mesh. Uh, this is another cool thing here. Uh, for example, this is our pod. So I can say that okay, so this is my Istio Ingress gateway, and then you know this product page is Istio's app. Uh, and then, you know, I can say that, you know, it's to your policy, uh, uh, you know, Docker. Uh, so this is my application. Uh, it's, to your, it's to your mixer. So this is it's to your application. Uh, uh, these are all applications. So I can tell that from the Ingress gateway, it has come to hello. Then hello has communicated with Docker. And then uh, the response has come back. And then it has come back to uh, this one. Okay. So, uh, yep. So and then um, another good uh, 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 another uh, another good thing is this Prometheus. I'll just quickly show Prometheus and then I'll just if we have enough time or just have to wrap this up. Or, uh, this will just take another. So so what I do is okay. So this Prometheus is listening on the cluster IP. I just have to change this to load balancer. So what I do is.
Okay, so I just go and change the cluster IP to load balancer. Okay, so it's been edited now. Uh, let's go and have a look. Okay, so Prometheus will have uh, will create this load balancer URL for me. Uh, let me go and copy this one. Uh, this should listen on 1990. Yeah, I hate this copy. Copy. Provisioning of load balancer will take a minute or so. So we just have to look for. So this load balancer is provisioned from AWS. So AWS takes some time, a uh, couple of minutes to do this. If it's not coming in the next one, I'll wrap it up. Uh, because AWS is provisioning the load balancer, uh, it takes it takes it takes a couple of minutes to come up. All right, don't bother. Thank you. Okay, what we might do is just do a couple of uh, questions uh, whilst we get next, next speaker uh, worked out, which is going to actually be Peter. And then after we've had uh, Peter, Peter's going to just lead you through some song and dance, which is his speciality, especially for Melbourne as well. And then we're going to get um, Elton, uh, who's going to be zooming in all the way from the UK for us. Well, over the interwebs anyway. Okay, so uh, uh, Sydney perspective, first of all, do we have any questions? There we go. This person. It's this built-in component of Istio. When you install Istio, uh, those things get installed as well. So uh, it is it is part of Istio framework. So uh, so so when you use Helm and then install those things, that, that's what I did at, at the top. I ran the Helm CRDs. So when you run those CRDs, uh, that will create those. Things. So and then uh, but uh, uh, but it will have cluster IP. Uh, so you will have to either use port forward. Uh, you will have to use port port forward. Or you uh, you will have to expose it as a load balancer. Yes, you can. Uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, it is called as intelligent routing. Uh, so you can have different versions. Uh, so uh, um, in your thing, uh, you can see that uh, uh, this is version one, version two. The CO documentation is very good now. Uh, it will have all the all the it, it's under subsets. In the in the I mean virtual service you you define subset in the subsets you define version and then you can do canary deployments you can do intelligent routing. Sorry. Yes, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So uh, the question was you know we can just load any applications in STO. Yes, you can load any application whether it is monolithic microservices, cron jobs, jobs in a piece. Right, right, right. Okay, so Istio comes with its own ingress controller. So, okay, sorry. 
Okay, so what's the difference about that is uh, that ingress controller AWS once, yeah. but what we are now doing is we are putting everything under Istio. Mm -hmm. So when you put everything under Istio, it has to come through Istio gateway. Uh, yeah, it has to come through Istio ingress uh, gateway, and then it has to go from Istio egress out uh, just gateway for uh, uh, for outward traffic. For inward traffic, it has to come via uh, Istio gateway. So the one you are saying is AWS ones. The one you are saying is non-STO pods. If you have non-STO pods, if you don't have the sidecar, uh, 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 this application, uh, then you use that uh, ingress gateways. But when you put everything inside STO, then you have to use STO's uh, uh, ingress gateway to reach to the I mean, pods. <laughs> Just quick over to Melbourne. It's going to be up to questions. Pop across on the side and afterwards. Well, we've got to go to Melbourne now. Sure. Uh, ben, if you can hear us, a few questions down there. Yeah, we can hear. Yeah, we can hear. It's a little bit hot in here, so I see everyone's getting a little bit tired. So either we need Apologies. to keep rolling, or we need to have a little bit of a stretch of legs and, and a, a, break, a quick break, or keep rolling. So I know it's getting a bit hot, and it's hard to hear with questions. You need to repeat the question. Okay, so we're down to Melbourne. Just to ask a couple of questions, if you guys are ready. Yeah, we have one question. So what okay. CI CD tools has been used here? Uh, the Sorry? Was, what CI CD tools are used? The question was, what CI CD tools are you using? Okay, so... Um, this is um, this is orchestration, uh, and then this is uh, this is separate to CI/CD tools. Uh, you can use any CI/CD tools, and then uh, you can plug in. Uh, okay, so you can use Spinnaker. Uh, so so, uh, uh, so if you want to use uh, I mean Spinnaker, uh, you can use Spinnaker for the CI/CD tool. Uh, here in this case, you know that is out of scope. Here we are talking about Istio. Uh, definitely, we can use Spinnaker. Uh, and then you know we can use Spinnaker to uh, to do the CI/CD. Uh, we can have a Spinnaker launch the uh, uh, the uh, the two microservices and things. Uh, Spinnaker is the answer, but you know that's a bit out of scope. Okay. Um, we can sort of answer that probably. Yeah. yeah. If, if you've got many different CI/CD tools, you can use, but you can use Spinnaker, right? <laughs> Spinnaker. Yeah, Spinnaker. <laughs> um, <laughs> Any other questions, guys, at all, down here in Melbourne, guys? Are we all pretty hot down here? Do you guys want to quickly like have a drink while, while we get the next one up and running? Do you guys want to quickly grab a drink and get some fresh air? Yeah. So, why don't we, as we get the next one up, we're going to go on mute while you start going. We just need to stretch and get some fresh air. It's really hot in this room. So, if that's okay, we'll keep moving. So, you're, so, just, so just to summarize, there's an awful lot of hot air coming out of Melbourne, is there? Yeah, <laughs> we, we've got an awful lot of people in Sydney agreeing. I don't know how. <laughs> All right, listen, it is now what's the time? Twenty-five past five-minute break. Five-minute break, and then we'll come on back yep. to uh, Peter. Uh, uh, Peter's going to share uh, a bit of a lightning talk with us some of his experience, which means that Elton will be on in about f fifteen minutes or so. Are we all good, Ben? Is that hot? He's going already. All right, there we go. We've got a five minute like yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Cool. Easy. Easy. Thanks, guys. What's all this about then? Is this going to be. Is this uh, Apple TV? Oh, just crack it in here. Do we know how to. Use your. Yeah.
Someone said to me, you know, you know a girl? Being that I'm 45 years old, but a little bit younger, but maybe just a, a different girl, but they said, you know a girl, you know video streaming? I said, I don't know both of those things, but usually they're in the same sentence. And long story short, I got hired to essentially make sure that the CDM is going to stay up for the court cut. If this starts keeps cracking like this, I'm just going to get you. Right? Everyone do that? You be the, you be the word, right? At Optus, we have 30 teams, over 30 teams. Sometimes we have 50 teams because we hire so many different vendors to come in and deal with apps. The biggest problem we've got with 30 teams is they have different processes. Agile is such an old thing, I feel embarrassed even talking about it, but at legacy companies for 25 years of telco community inside, there's a lot of 70 year old men and women in dirty socks, still cutting pearl. You have to deal with those app teams and make sure they can be their app to say, please pick us up. Please make sure it's 100% performance and please ensure that it's robust to network conditions because every now and then we might have some outages, but just make sure my app is working. We have different text apps. Now, I put all the nice new text apps here, but I can guarantee you where I work, and there's a lot. There's a different view now. Don't put those on the internet because I'll be surprised tomorrow. But where I work, there's a lot of legacy technology. Um, we have only just, we, we try every day to talk about containerization, CICD pathways. It's a great concept. You're here tonight to try and understand all that sort of stuff and be a part of that community. I'm, I'm doing the same thing. I want to be part of the community. I'm here to introduce my, my products and eventually I. Uh, one of the other things we the other problem we've got is the different service infrastructure as well. Something on the public cloud, very good. Although new organisations will need to be inside of Office, are basically going to public cloud because of the people like OPEX, they don't like CapEx. I mean, you tell someone you're going to go spend $400,000, like, I can't just go to AWS and spend, like, say, 40 bucks because those sort of, like, entries do that last week and serve, like, 4 million people. Um, all of these people want to have that to make sure they're is that all right? That's it. Stay there. Long long long. So it's hard for me to keep my center of gravity in the middle. Don't move. Is this working well? Is this microphone? Is that real good? No, no, no. Okay. Super high tech. Super high tech. I like James Cameron word of you, right? Um, so we are 100%. As in the, the added workflow is. is Super old school. We have dev and then we have ops. Um, uh, how many people have still not really created a CICD pathway to an organization throughout their entire organization? Is anyone else here trying to fly with management and say, hey, don't you want to publish every day or every other day? Or you say you want to publish every other day, but you know, you haven't really given us the tools or the opportunity to do that. I know there's a few of you here, a couple of great companies with Aaron up over there. What we want to get to is a full DevOps pathway. My new position at Optus, after being there for gloriously 10 months, is essentially to try and unify the development of the environment for a few of the teams. One of them is the video stream. So we get all of the different um, vendors we use, which is a lot of them. There's a, in fact, there's a quick slide down here. I'm not going to do too much. In fact, I've got two more minutes and I'm out of here. This is the workflow of a typical user in the video pipeline. We have to go into third party services and get all their advisement, authorization checking, all their favorites, their histories, and then go into the video system before they can even get a video on the assignment, which is really just one or two user events. A lot of stuff happens in the background of third party public networks, private networks, and hybrid clouds that essentially even just get you to video, once you're on the video, there's still quite a lot of stuff that happens in different, varying, hybrid, public, private, cloud environments. Very difficult as an operations person to essentially convince the apps people that they, even though I hear all the time, operations people say to anybody standing in, operations people say to me all the time, I don't know the logic of this app. How can I test for an instant for an HTTP response 200, 100, 503, 401? That's all I can tell you. I don't need to develop it. So, how the other person make me responsible to keeping it up and 
performance and flexible to network conditions. The biggest problem in unifying development and operations in the current organization I'm in is two things. One is performance testing and one is the elastic deployment environment. If we want to go to the cloud, we need to, in operations, we need to give app developers the right tools so they can essentially make the right decisions around what tools they want to use in the cloud. Uh, the best day probably happened this week after being in for a very, seemed like a long time. One of the app developers came to me and said they want me to load test uh, um, Cop main AWS service to replace one of the services we got because they started thinking about load and being able to keep the service on. And when you've got app developers starting to think about the service thing up, it's just about the logic of the unit testing, not yet fast. When I start thinking about, hey, can it pass the 10,000 in a second? When you're in video, you would just like war. You have essentially 90% of your time is forward and nothing happens. And then you have sheer moments of complete terror. I got one of my colleagues up the back here, young gentleman, not that young, who basically works on the internet production side of things. And he will tell you that basically, is broadcast exciting, but it's also terrifying. Your RAM models go from 90 percent of all your customers coming within 10 minutes. And then half time, they go off and they do it again. And your network better be resilient, flexible, stable, redundant, and you better do it off the smell of an oily rag or with very little resources because other people out there are doing it as well. That's only one of the things I work with. We work with many, many teams in office. The biggest problem in getting to that elastic cloud stage for me is getting these guys to start thinking in the app side, app development side about can it stay up, can it be load tested, can you be can it perform flexible. So what we've built is a pen. Unfortunately, a lot of the time in the past, operation people have been charged for ensuring all of the apps are performing, but they don't really have a lot of so what we've done is actually developed a very simple way for app developers to performance test um, their APIs and various different services. It's a, I'm not going to go through it tonight because that wasn't Amanda. This is going to be say hello to the Unity community and say g'day. I've got, uh, I'm going to leave this particular um, URL up here or you can come talk to me afterwards. If anyone's going to be performing the testing, if involved in the testing here tonight, I'm more than happy to find you here afterwards. See, if these guys over here, all right, very good. It's always a good looking one, though, like me. Um, uh, so, anyway, I'm just going to tell you very quickly we built it into a um, Docker Swarm. That's what I'm here because of the Docker Club, or the Docker Meetup Group. Um, we built uh, Tank, which is a, a Russian tool, Yandex Tank. Um, including the Phantom, which is uh, one of the really performing low generation and low scheduling tools. It gets deployed in a Docker swarm, and then essentially you have a web GUI that uh, you can, anyone uh, of any level can essentially uh, build the um, low testing model and potentially load test very quickly to find out whether that app is performing or not. If it's deep, it doesn't do it, it's absolutely not. It, but it, what it doesn't do is it really abstract, well, what it does do is it extracts a lot of the complexity of JDA, Pandora, BFG, and all those other tools out there that I have told all the app developers to use. I said it's too hard, it's too, 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 too difficult, too hard to get to market. So what we've done is we actually can do something called TensorFlow, we'd love you to check it out. Uh, it uses the Docker API to essentially swarm out of its tank. Uh, instances and it uses log stash and metric data to start back um, data and then pretend it in real time on for a uh, um, If you're interested in finding out more, uh, or being part of the community helping us develop it, love to reach out, people out. Thanks very much. I'll hand you over to the email. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's done right, but it only happens for the good looking ones there, eh? All right, Peter, thank you very much. Um, who, who has got some, um, like a CRNC pipeline thing or some sort of or whatever? Okay, if you have, who's got our testing station there? 
Who's got a load testing stage in there? Who thinks we should have a load testing stage in there? I think I should get a more hands on that. Um, who would like to know a bit more about how to, um, how to do load testing using some mind proper technology? Yeah. Alright, a bit more detail. What I might do is see if we can, you know, everybody that speaks, by the way, we pay them, we pay them at least a million dollars, which is about 85 million quid for Elson tonight. Um, so if anyone wants to speak, I'm going to have to pay, you know, Peter, another million dollars to maybe come on next month just to share a bit more detail, if we're interested in that. Yeah? Okay, cool. All right, um, what I might do is see if the interwebs are working. And we have Elton online. So somebody who knows what they're doing is probably going to have to help you. Yeah. Elton, do you want to come off mute and uh, give us an audio check? Technology. I love it. I'm, 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 here. I'm here. Hello. Yeah. Hello. You're the guy with paying uh, 18 million quid to. Excellent. Um, I'll send you my PayPal details. No problem. It's all you can do. <laughs> I'm sure it's the island. I'm sure it's the island. So, Sydney might have to go on mute. I think if we all go on mute while Ellen goes through the presentation, so there's a bit of echo. Feedback. Cut out, yeah. Okay. Okay, well, it's not gone quiet, so I'm going to assume you can hear me. Um, hello, my name's Elton, I work for Docker. Uh, great to be here, although I'm obviously not there. Uh, but I'm going to do the session that I did at DockerCon in San Francisco, um, updated a little bit with all the, the most recent stuff that's happened. This session is, is all about taking your existing applications and running them in Docker, but making them behave like new applications. So all the cool stuff we did with the first session about Istio and, and having um, a service mesh and uh, sidecars and all that sort of stuff, uh, that's, what, that's the, the kind of the cutting edge of, of the technology world, but uh, an awful lot of folks in their day job are going back and working with monoliths. And um, this session is about how you can bring your monoliths into the modern world without a complete rewrite. So there are uh, three things I'm going to cover. So I'm going to start with just how you can run legacy apps in Docker. I've got two demo applications. One is a .NET app that runs on Windows containers, and the other is a Java app that runs on Linux containers. Um, the five patterns I'm going to show you, I've got demos for, for all of them, and it's all on GitHub. So I'm going to mix and match to keep things interesting. But if you're, uh, if you're more interested in Linux or more interested in Windows, hop to the, the GitHub repo at the end. Uh, I'll give you the URL, and you can walk through all the demos for all of them. Um, the second thing I'm going to cover is, is how the, the patterns I'm going to walk through will, will make your legacy monolithic apps behave like cloud native apps. So there's nothing wrong with running a monolith in a container if it, if it gets you uh, onto the cloud, if that's what you want to do. If you're running on a legacy operating system and you want to get to the cloud, or you've got a data center refresh and modern infrastructure coming in and you want to move your apps, putting them in containers first and just running them gives you all the stuff that you get from Docker anyway. So the portability, the security, the efficiency, you get all that. The fact that it's a monolith doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. But the way you package your monolith to run in containers, if you package it correctly, you can work with it exactly the same way as your, as your new cloud native apps. So you can have one cluster that's running everything. It's running your legacy Java apps on Linux nodes and your legacy Windows apps on Windows nodes, all in containers, and your cloud native app and your serverless framework all on a single cluster. You manage everything in the same way, you build it, you deploy it, you run it in the same way, um, and the developers run the same stack on their laptop. So uh, it gives you the kind of the holy grail of having one big cluster that just runs all your types of application. Okay, so the, the core of this is that when you're running apps in containers, and it doesn't matter what orchestrator you're using, whether you're using Swarm or Kubernetes or any of the others, um, all those apps look the same. So this could, be, this could be a web app and a database and a batch process. The orchestrator doesn't care. It's just a container, and the, the connection points between the orchestrator and the container are the same for every type of app. So from the orchestrator's point of view, when you're running these things in containers, it's like, it's like punching a hole in the, in the fabric to, to let, these things, let these apps come and join in. Um, for modern platforms, they connect really nicely with that. So uh, 
things like Node.js, uh, when you're running an app in Node.js, the, just the way it runs by default works really nicely in a container orchestrator. Each of these little blobs of the jigsaw piece is one of the patterns I'm going to talk about. So when you're running older apps, you can run them in containers, but they don't easily fit into the into the hole. They don't they don't connect with the with the um, with the orchestration fabric in the same way that a new app does, just because of the historical way that they were designed to run on a long lived virtual machine. So what I'm going to do in this session is kind of show you how you can uh, just by just with, with some extra tools in your Docker file and the way you the way you package it in your application, fill out the holes and make everything run like a like a new application. So these are the five patterns I'm going to cover. Uh, and this is kind of aimed at, it doesn't matter whether you're from a, a dev background or an ops background. Uh, I think the beauty of, of Docker is that it kind of helps you to, to, to break down those walls because everyone's using the same technology and the same tools. So, you know, it kind of makes it simpler to work in a dev ops way. So the five things to cover, um, they're fairly basic. They're, they're the kind of key, the key attributes of your application. So firstly, it's logs. Getting logs out of your application into your orchestrator. So uh, Docker and Kubernetes have um, log logging plugging uh, mechanisms. So as long as the logs are coming out of the container into into the into the fabric that's running them, then you can ship them anywhere. Uh, so getting config into the application. So a new application might be might be comfortable with reading configuration from environment variables, say, whereas a legacy application will have an old XML file somewhere. So dealing with that so that you can inject the config into the container from, from the, uh, the orchestrator. Uh, checking for dependencies. So most legacy applications are, are designed with the assumption that their dependencies are always available. You know, if I'm a web app writing to a database and reading from a database, I just I don't do any retries to make sure the database is there because like I'm all I'm doing is using the database. If it's not there, the app just doesn't run, which is which is fine in the kind of legacy world where you've got a big database server and a big web server. But in the modern world where all these things are spinning up and, and moving around and there could be uh, short term connection issues, you need to be able to check your dependencies are up before that before they um, before your application starts. And then getting your health of your, your application out from the container. So telling the orchestrator whether your app is functioning correctly, because then the orchestrator can take, um, can take measures to, to, to repair it if it's gone bad. Uh, so it could be as simple as uh, if a health check fails, the orchestrator kills your container and spins up a new one. But that means your application then is self-healing, which is something that a, a legacy monolith wouldn't have. But the way you package it to run in a container means you can get that, that sort of benefit from a cloud native app for your existing applications. And the last one is metrics. We've already seen Grafana and Prometheus today. There's no reason why you can't bring your legacy apps into the, the same world of monitoring that you have for your, your new cloud native apps. So um, again, the, the, the idea of being able to take what's currently in your application and just make it available to the orchestrator so you can treat all your apps in the same way. So those are the five things I'm going to cover. Uh, and then you'll get to the point where your brand new cloud native apps running in a modern platform work exactly the same way as your existing apps. So filling out the edges and connecting with the orchestrator in a way that makes it simple for you to manage these things. Okay, so a couple of things to bear in mind in this. I'm calling this making monoliths at cloud native, taking your old applications and making them so that they look and feel like new applications. There's a couple of things. Firstly, you should be able to do this without changing code. Because if you're taking an existing application and you want to move it to containers so you can run it in the cloud or on, a, on modern, um, modern hardware, changing code shouldn't be part of that. You should be able to take your existing deployment mechanism, whatever that is, whether it's a jar file or a zip file or a Windows MSI, and just use that to, to package up your container. You shouldn't need to change code because as soon as you change code, it's not the same thing that's currently running in production. You have to do all your regression tests. And if you worked on big enterprise applications, that have got five million lines of code, a regression test cycle could take three weeks, and you can't you can't really do that. So if you don't change code as the, as your starting point, then uh, you're in a good position to avoid all that stuff. The second thing I think is important is to be technology independent, and I'm, I'm particularly talking about the orchestrator there. So um, if you're if you're familiar with the orchestration options, uh, Swarm is a really simple and opinionated. Kubernetes has more functionality, but it's a lot it's a lot more complex to get started with. The big difference between them is uh, the unit of, of deployment. So uh, Docker Swarm, you run the service, the smallest unit is the container, whereas in Kubernetes, the smallest unit is a pod that can have multiple containers. 
Now, some of the some of the techniques I'm going to show you would work really nicely as a sidecar in a in a Kubernetes pod, but that basically means you only have you can only use Kubernetes. So if you're if you're solving Kubernetes, that's fine, but it does mean that in every environment you have to be running Kube. So you have to have your devs have to be using Kube to make sure that all the sidecars spin up in the same way. My preference is to is to put as much of that logic as possible in the container. And that ties in with the third part is don't break the dev workflow. So all the demos I'm going to show you, um, although there's there's an uh, increasing amount of complexity as we add in all these patterns, the basic idea is that a dev should be able to do Docker container run and the app should just work. So even though there are there are these connection points to let you integrate with the orchestrator to get config and expose logs and all that sort of stuff, the dev shouldn't need to know any of that stuff. They should be able to just run a container with no options and it should just work. So packaging up so it runs in a, in a default configuration in the dev world. So those are the three things to kind of bear in mind as I go through. Okay, so on to the first one. So the first one is logging. So getting logs out of a, out of a container seems like a fairly simple thing to do. But if you think of a legacy application, they've probably got some sort of elaborate logging framework that has been used in the company for 10 years, log4j or log4net or, or whatever they're using. And that's probably writing to a file somewhere. So when I run my app in a container now, that, that log is not coming out from the console. It's not coming out from the process that, that Docker is watching. So it's not feeding into the orchestrator. It's just sat in a file somewhere that Docker doesn't know anything about. So the first part is just, it's just making that uh, log file into a known place. So make sure that when I'm writing the logs, they go to a single endpoint, a single file, or in Windows, the event log, or a SID log, or whatever I'm using. And then I package a, a relay utility along with my application. So when I start my application, that's going to run in the background, and my log relay will run in the foreground. It will scrape up all the logs from the, from the known location and spit them back out from the container so that my orchestrator now gets the log straight in. So I don't need to do anything special to make that happen. Now, there's, a, there's, a, there's an issue with running this in the foreground because, uh, of course, Docker will, when it starts an application in a container, it watches the application process, and that's the thing it uses to make sure the application is still up and running. Now, your, your new your application process, in this case, is just your log relay, which is not the thing you, you care about. Uh, but we'll come to that later on when we look at, we look at having proper health checks. So we're going we're gonna to configure our application to write a log file to a known place. We're going to package up a relay utility, and we're going to use that utility when we start the application. Okay, most of this session is demos, by the way, apart from the, all the talking I've done so far. So let's show you what we've got here. This is my uh, demo application. So I've got a .NET application. It doesn't do anything. There are two. There are two features. You can write some logs and you can connect to a database. The Java version is uh, pretty much exactly the same. These are both using ancient technologies. So I'm using uh, .NET 3.5. And uh, this is uh, Java JSP. So the, these are kind of 10 year old application stacks. And I'm deliberately, you'll see the Docker files in a moment. I'm not building the code. I'm not using multi stage Docker files. I'm using a zip file that's already got the application bundled. Okay. So if I go to my .NET application, this is the default configuration that's bundled with my application. So my log configuration is going to write to a, a known log file. And my application settings say that when I click this button, it's going to write the logs five times. So if I click on write logs, uh, it's going to tell me that it wrote some log entries. And now those log entries are in this file, and Docker knows nothing about that. So this is the first version of my application. This is running in a container, but the log file is, is something that Docker doesn't know anything about. So if I switch to the UI, this, I'm running this. Uh, this is a Docker, um, Docker Enterprise cluster. So I've got, let me just quickly show you this. I've got a bunch of nodes. I've got a mixture of Windows and Linux. Some of these are Swarm. Some are mixed um, Swarm and Kubernetes. I've deployed this as a Swarm service. So I'll go to my .NET front end. I can check out the containers. And if I look at this and look at the logs, we can stay here all day and it won't show me anything at all because there are no log entries coming out of this container. OK, so the first thing I'm going to do is package this up so that I can get the logs out. Now, what I've got in here, this demo code is all up on GitHub, so I'll show you the link for this. The version one of my, uh, version zero, which is what's currently running of my web application, this is my .NET application. Uh, if you haven't seen Windows containers, it, it's exactly the same principles as Linux containers. So you have a Docker file to package it up, uh, you do Docker image build, then you get an image that you can share on the registry, and then you run it in a container. This is saying starting from a, a Microsoft image that's got all my prerequisites. I copy in the zip file, which is my application, and then I just expand the archive and then create a website. So this is just setting up my application. Uh, if, you're, if you're not familiar with Windows, it's just PowerShell stuff. It's fairly simple. So that's what's currently running. There's nothing in there to help me get the logs out. 
Now my version one, I've got a couple of changes. I've got a volume in here for my logs so that the log directory that I'm using is always going to be in a volume, whether I, whether I map it or not. I've got a startup script, which I'm copying in. This is just a PowerShell script. And I'm setting that as the entry point for my application. So this is my log relay utility. If I wanted to, I could build you know, a complicated application to do it for me. But in this case, I can do it all with a, with a fairly simple script. So this script, it starts the web server. So W3SVC is the Windows web server. And then it makes a first request to the application. And that's going to kick off the log. So at this point, I will have a log file. And then this is the relay. So this is just looking at that log file, tailing the log, and put, printing it back out to the console. So all that's going to do is read that log file constantly. Every time there's a new entry, it'll spit it back out to the console, which then comes into the world of Docker. So that's coming out of the containers um, process so that the orchestrator can read these logs. So to deploy this, I've already built all these things because I'm trying to do a lot of demos, so we'd be here all day if I didn't. Uh, version one of my stack is just using the new version of my application. So I'm using, um, this is Docker Compose, but I'm going to use this to deploy to my production cluster. So there's the image I'm going to use. Uh, these are the ports I'm going to publish. And then because it's, a, it's a, a hybrid cluster, I've got a placement constraint here saying, these are Windows containers. They have to run on a Windows node. Docker would work that out for me, but if I put that um, constraint in, then it, it stops it having to work it out. It just makes it deploy a little bit faster. OK, so let's go and deploy this. So here's my cluster. Uh, my cluster is running somewhere in America. I'm in Europe presenting to you in Australia. So it might take a little while. So that's the same cluster that I was showing you the UI for. I've got a couple of, I've got a manager, I've got my trusted registry, a couple of Windows nodes, a couple of Linux nodes. So I've already got my stack deployed. So I'm, I'm so confident that my demo is not going to break anything. I'm using my production cluster where I host my blog. And then, then NetFX is the .NET one. So what I'm going to do is deploy the next version. So let's copy and paste this command. So Docker stack deploy, my version 1 YAML that I've just shown you, and it's going to update my NetFX, my .NET application. So this is going to, uh, there's only one container running for each of these, so it's going to update that container, deploy the new version of the application, and then this is a, a legacy application. So the way this starts is um, using a background Windows service. And because of the way Windows services work, this isn't going to respond instantly. So the container's up and running now. My container's up and it's, it's started. But it takes a few seconds for the, uh, the web process to kick off. And then it does all the background pre-compiling and that sort of stuff. So it takes a few seconds. Uh, we can we'll deal with that later on. So this is a new container. It's just the same application because it's the same code. Uh, I've got my same configuration in here. But now when I click this button, it's not a very impressive demo. I didn't made no promises about how impressive it is. But now the log entries are coming to this file, and my container is tailing that file. So now when I go and browse to this, I should be able to go and see the log entries. So my support services. And there's my .NET one. If I check the containers, I see the old container is exited. That's the old version that, I've, that I was previously using. I've got a new one that's been up for a minute. I can check the logs. And those are my log entries. So like, this, is, this is real, like, um, uh, this is foundational stuff. Like, I have to be able to get logs out. Otherwise, I can't do all the smart stuff. Like, it, it's pretty easy to plug in a logging framework that pulls out all the logs from your containers, puts them in Elasticsearch. You put a Kibana front end on top of it. That's fantastic. That's, that's the value-added stuff. But to get to that point, your legacy apps need to be pulling logs out into, the, into, your, um, into your orchestrator. Otherwise, you, you can't get any of that benefit. But once you've got to this stage, then all these things, I could be using Splunk. We, there's a Splunk plugin for Docker that just puts everything straight into Splunk. And it doesn't matter whether it's my 10-year-old legacy app or my brand new Go application. Everything filters into the same way. OK, so that's the first part. And it's the same, it's the same for any application stack. Because uh, the pattern applies to anything. So all you're going to do is make sure that your logs are being written to a known place, and then you're going to relay them back out as part, of your, as part of your container startup. So it's fairly simple, but it's foundational stuff. OK, so the next one is config. So I've got my logs out. The second thing is I want to be able to push configuration in. So my, my container, like I said, 
at the beginning, I want to make sure that people can just do Docker container run. So I'm going to bundle some default configuration with my application. So in the case of, uh, in the case of my uh, .NET application, I've got an XML file. Uh, in the case of my Java application, I've got a couple of properties files in there setting up um, uh, the settings that, that can differ between environments. But what I want to be able to do is take that same image and run it with a different configuration get the config from the orchestrator. So both Docker, uh, Docker Swarm and Kubernetes have the notion of storing configuration objects in the orchestrator, um, either as, as plain text or as encrypted secrets. And then you can surface them inside the container. And the way they surface is at a known file location. So for this pattern, what you need to do is you're going to bundle default configuration with your image. Uh, your, your configuration files will be at a known path, a path that you know about, and you're going to overwrite that path um, in, your, in your Docker file when, when your application starts. So when you start your application in the container, in your startup script, you're going to say, does the config exist in the orchestrator? And if so, overwrite my default that I've got in my container. I'm using the same image everywhere because that's a central point of Docker is make sure that the, what you're pushing as you go to each environment is the, exactly the same image, the same binaries, but allow the environment to, to set up the configuration for each, each, different, um, each different release. Okay, so I'm going to switch to Java for this. Now, uh, it's, I'm not a professional Java developer, so uh, please don't complain about my code. So here's my Java application. The stuff that comes from configuration is this value here how many times I should write logs, uh, my, my database connection, and the setup for the logging. So for this case, for my, my default configuration that I'm bundling um, with my Java application, I'm writing to a log file, I'm writing five instances, and I use localhost. So this is going to expect to connect to a MySQL database that's on the same server. So uh, if I go and check out, if I do my same thing, if I click on write logs, uh, again, it's going to write logs here. Now, this is running in Tomcat. So Tomcat, the Tomcat image, already does um, write logs back out to the, to, from the console, but not from this file. So what I need to do is change my configuration so that this uses the console handler, and then it will come out automatically for me. So what I've got in here, let me show you what I've got. Uh, I've got, this down. I've already got some um, configs stored in my cluster. So I've got a few things here that I've already uploaded, and if I show you what they look like, I will take my Java logging and show you the content. Oh, no, that's not going to do anything, is it? Let's copy and paste the right thing. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, an XML. So this is my. Um, my log for, log for j properties file that I've uploaded. Here's the content. So I'm using the console handler and I'm setting the level to debug. So this is a file that I've already uploaded. I've saved it in my uh, in my cluster and I can surface that inside my container. Now the way I make that happen is inside my uh, Docker file for version two. So version one of my Docker file. I'm starting from Tomcat. I copy in my Java file that I've already built. Uh, and then I just set it up. So I, I, I remove the default uh, web app, unzip my new one, and then uh, remove the zip file. And so that's all I need to do to deploy this on, on Tomcat. Now my version two does the same, but it copies in, uh, it sets some environment variables. So it says where the root application is. It says where to find the, um, the properties path and the web XML path. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm still using my default files, that are my default config files that are bundled with the image, but I'm presenting some environment variables. So I can, when the container starts, I can tell it to get those config files from a different location. And then I've got a startup script file. And all the startup script file does is when it runs, uh, it will look to see if any of those environment variables are specified. So if there's a logging properties path environment variable passed into the container, then it will overwrite it with a, with a, a symbolic link. So it'll, it'll basically say, take this file that's come, from the, that's come from the orchestrator, which is actually my configuration object stored inside Swarm, and surface it to this URL, which means when the application goes and looks for the logging properties, it's actually going to read the file that's coming from the, from the orchestrator, because that's overwritten the default that comes in with the application. So that's the so the Docker file just just does that redirect at the start, which is just creating symbolic links, and then in the Swarm, my version two Swarm, I've got my so the difference between version one just has my Java application, uh, I've got my ports to publish, and I'm constraining it to run on Linux nodes, 
and then version two by adding the configs. So the source is the name of the config object in the cluster. The target is the location to surface it in, inside the container, and then I can specify a mode to say who can access it. I've done it for my logging and for my web XML, which is my application settings. And then I've got my environment variables to say the logging properties path is that path there, which is where the config object gets, gets surfaced. So when this container starts, it will see there's an environment variable telling it where to get the logging properties from. And then it will create the symbolic link and then uh, it will read those, those values from the, um, uh, from, from, uh, the, the config object rather than the defaults that are bundled with it. Okay, so let's go and deploy this. So you'll see the way that I'm working with these things is exactly the same. It's a Docker stack deploy. I'm using my, my uh, Java uh, stack file that I've just shown you, and I'm deploying it on top of my Java application. So this is going to run in Linux containers on my spawn, but I'm going to work with it in exactly the same way. So now I'll browse back here. So this is F1. I should see a new container. Let's go do this this way. Okay, so I've got a new container. Don't worry about this slow mode. That comes, that's a, uh, an intriguing thing that comes later on. So I've got a new container, same application, but now my, my logging is coming from the con is using the console handler, and my log current is going to be three. So I haven't changed any of the application. Uh, it's the same image. It's the same, um, uh, it's the same deployment mechanism. But now when I click on the right logs, it's going to write to the console handler. And because of the Tomcat base image is already relaying, it's got its own relay out to the out to Docker, then I should see those log entries in there. So let's go and browse back to my services. So swarm services. I should periodically check that my blog's still up as well, actually, I suppose. So there's my Java web application. I'm going to look at the containers. So there's the one that's been replaced 58 seconds ago. Here's the new one. And if I look at the logs, I'll see a whole bunch of Catalina logs. So this is all the Tomcat stuff that happens when it starts. But right at the beginning, there's the log entries from my startup script saying that it's redirected uh, the logging properties file to read from the path provided by the orchestrator. And then right at the bottom, I'm going to see my application log entries, uh, which are just my, I, the code just goes and loops through and writes some log entries with, a, with an index. So it's written three of those as, as requested by the configuration. So the app's exactly the same, but the, the way I've packaged it in my Docker file is to look for those external configuration files, and if it finds them, just to overwrite the defaults that are in there. Okay. Okay, so that's configuration. So at this point now, we're getting logs out of our container, which is it could be buried in some file or in the event log or whatever. We're getting them out and into the orchestrator. And then from the orchestrator, we're getting our configuration. The next thing we need is dependencies. So uh, if your application uses a database and a, and a cache and a bunch of APIs and all those sorts of things, uh, they need to be there typically when the container starts. But the container orchestrators don't provide any kind of guarantees about starting things in specific orders because that kind of goes against the whole point of a, of a microservices architecture, where these things can start up at any time. You need to be able to scale them all incredibly quickly, and you can't say, uh, don't start um, service three until service two has started, because then the orchestrator needs to keep, a, needs to keep a, a check on how many of those are running and how many are available. So typically in a, in a microservices world, when, you're, when your service starts up, it checks if its dependencies are available, and if not, It'll just, it'll just die, and then the orchestrator will start up a replacement. And that will happen until everything's ready. And that typically doesn't happen with a, with a legacy application. It will, the application will start, but it won't try and connect to a dependency until you use some feature that tries to use, to use your dependency. And then it'll just buy them out if, if there's nothing there. So this pattern is about adding another utility into your Docker image, which is going to check for your dependencies um, when, the, when the application starts. So this is a startup thing. When my container runs, uh, I'm going to have a new utility that runs before my application, and it's going to check all my dependencies that the app needs. And this is going to use, ideally, the same application platform that your, that your app is written in, and the same configuration mechanism. So your dependency check utility is going to read the config from wherever your app reads the config from, and it's going to use that to check those dependencies exist. 
the last word here is robust because this does need to be robust. Like your dependency checking utility needs to have uh, that whatever logic you need to make sure that it that it just works correctly. That if the dependencies are there, then your and the de dependency checker finishes and your app can start. If there's a problem with the dependencies, then the container ends gracefully and uh, the orchestrator can spin up a replacement. Okay, so I'm going to go back to .NET for this. But like I said, all the demos are um, in the in the other the other framework too. So in the .NET world. What this looks like. Let's switch over here to the right screen. So this is the this is the um, oh, let's browse it here. So this is the database access thing. So in here, in my configuration, I'm just using localhost. Well, I'm inside a container now, so there is no database living at localhost. If I click this button, uh, it's going to go and try and connect to SQL Server and run a, run a SQL statement and show me the output. It's going to wait a little while because it's going to, there's, a, there's a connection timeout, which by default is 20 seconds or something. So it's going to wait that long to try and reach the server to execute the command, and then it's going to come back and fail. I'm going to see an error. There we are, right on cue. Uh, now the app shouldn't run if if I can't get to the database. Like that's a pre that's a prerequisite for my application is the database should be there. So what I'm going to do is bundle that in, that logic into my Docker file. Again, I don't want to change my application code because this could be an app that no one's worked on for years. So what I've got in here in my version two Docker file, no nope, version three Docker file. So I've been adding, uh, actually with my version two, this is, this is adding the configuration stuff. So like I demoed to you with the Java app, I've done the same with my .NET app, exactly the same principle. I've got environment variables saying where the configuration files should come from. And then in my startup script, I've got a little, um, little utility that's going to redirect from the expected location to wherever the files actually are coming from. And now in version three, I've got a new thing in here, which is my dependency checker. So this is a, another zip file. This is a .NET console application. Uh, the Java version just has a jar file. And what that dependency checker does is it uh, uses the same config files as the app, and it just checks it can reach everything. And the advantage of having an application rather than a script is it lets you, um, for a start of it, it minimizes your dependencies. So if, I, if I, I use curl, maybe, I would have a dependency on curl, which would make things difficult if I was running an Alpine. Um, but using the same platform means I can use the same config files, and I can use all, all the uh, whatever logic I need to, to make my application work. So in the .NET world, let me show you this quickly, uh, I can use, um, when my dependency checker runs, it's going to use, uh, there's, a, there's a framework in .NET called Poly, which has policies for things like retries. So it's going to look for a SQL exception if I can't reach the database. It's going to retry three times. So when my container starts, this is going to be the first thing that runs. It's going to try and connect to the database. If that fails, it'll try a few more times. And if it finally gets there, uh, it'll say dependency is OK. It'll return 0, which means the app has been successful. Otherwise, it'll return 1, and the container will end. It'll go, it'll go into the exited state, because this is the, the, the startup for the container. And at that point, the orchestrator knows it's failed, and it can take evasive action. Uh, same deal with, with the Java world. So in the Java source, I've got a dependency checker in here way down here uh, there's the main java and again i'm using uh, i'm using a, a fail safe here with a similar retry policy so i'm saying connect to my sql uh, my sql connection which is my sql here uh, with a, with three retries and the, exactly the same logic if everything is okay within those three retries then i exit with a zero if there's a failure then i exit with a one and then the orchestrator knows there's been a problem and it will it will start a new container okay so uh, let's go and deploy this. If I go down here and deploy version three of my stack. So the, the stack file I'm about to deploy is this one here, Swarm version three. And I've got a flag in here saying the dependency is enabled. So this is part of not breaking the developer workflow. So if developers, uh, so by default, this is a zero, so which means the dependency check doesn't run on startup. And that's so devs who are maybe not using all the dependencies can just run the container. Maybe if, they, um, uh, if, they, if, if the container needs a message queue and a database and a cache, uh, if I'm just a local dev working on a feature that doesn't need them, I still want to be able to run in a container. So I'll disable the, the dependency check by default. But in this one, I'm enabling my dependency check. And I've got all these other bits and pieces for my configuration. And I'm also using a secret for my database connection string. Secrets in Swarm um, are exactly the same as, as config objects, but encrypted in the cluster. So I can't see the contents of that even if I, even if I look for it. So actually, if I show you that, 
if I do a inspect, if I inspect my .NET connection settings, oh well, that's yeah, that's not great. Right, <laughs> uh, that's doing a fail. I would expect. So let's just make sure I've got that right. Oh yes, 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 yes. That was NetFX connection strings. Oh, now down to Windows mode clear. Okay, config LS. Hmm, yeah, I'm not great. So let me create that first and I'll show you how it works. So if I do connection strings, this is the file I'm using. So this is XML uh, that I'm going to save as a secret. I'm going to paste that in there. Once it's gone into the, see it already exists, I thought it already existed. Once it's gone in there, um, then it's encrypted. I can't see it, even as an administrator, I can't see the content. It only gets unencrypted when um, inside, inside a container. So let's go and deploy my version 3, which uses that. So this is going to spin up a, uh, a database for me. So now I'm going to have a database running in the container in the same Docker network as my web application. So I should be able to reach that. And it's also using my configured, uh, my configured config settings that are coming from the cluster. So now when I browse here again, uh, it's going to start up. And if I go and actually look at my services, let's clear this filter. My services now, I've got, I've got a NetFX SQL Server, so that's my database. I've got my NetFX web, and I should have a few containers here. I've got this one that's been up for 10 seconds, and that's the previous one, the version that was running. If I look at the one that's just started and look at the logs, I will see validating dependencies, dependency OK. So this is, this is as it happens, the database container has started and the database was up and ready to receive connections by the time the web container started. So the dependency check was OK, so it's carried on. Um, if, the, uh, if the dependency, the, the, the database hadn't started in time, then the dependency check would have failed, the container would have been killed, and a new one would have started, and then it would have found it. So eventually, it would have it, it would have eventually um, worked it out and got itself up and running. Okay, so the difference here is my connection string config, instead of using local host, is now using SQL Server, which is the name of my database container. So Docker will resolve that for me. So now when I click execute SQL, I should. Ah, excellent. So the, all this does, this just, like I said, it's not an exciting demo. Like, I'm not a front-end developer. If you look closely, you'll see that the design skills <laughs> on display here are not superb. What this does is it executes a, a get date against the database, shows you the database time. It's just to prove that the connection has to be there, otherwise the app wouldn't start. So this dependency checker is just a nice little thing that makes sure everything's up and running for your legacy app before it starts, because your legacy app probably doesn't do anything smart, uh, like checking that dependencies can be reached. It just assumes they're going to be there. OK, so how far have I got? I've done logs, I've done config, I've done dependencies. So the, the, the flip side to checking that the dependencies exist, and by the way, these don't have to be containers. Your dependency checker can check uh, external services, whatever, whatever it needs, it needs to, to, for your application to run. The flip side of making sure that the app has everything it needs is feeding back to the orchestrator to say that the app is still healthy. So again, this is something that, uh, that, that legacy apps just don't do. Very, very few applications will have their own notion of a, of a health check endpoint that you can go and have a look at them. But it's easy to bundle that in with Docker when you put these things in, in, uh, in containers. So again, there's a, there's a separate utility here that you bundle alongside your application, and that means you don't have to change app code. Uh, the dependency checker stuff and the health check stuff, you could do that in the application code. So there's no reason in the application startup you can't put the logic that I've got in my, in my separate dependency checker. And there's no reason why you can't have a health check endpoint as part of your application. But it does mean going and changing code. So that's fine for an application that's, that's currently under development, but if it genuinely is a legacy app that gets used but isn't being worked on, then being able to do the same pattern but with a, with a separate utility that doesn't mean you change code uh, is really useful. So we're going to bundle a health check utility that's just going to make sure that everything the app needs to run is there and that the app can run successfully. It's going to run peri peri periodically by the orchestrator. 
So because I'm using Swarm, I will put that into the Docker file. I'll put a health check into the Docker file, and Swarm will execute that for me. If I was using Cube, I would put the health check um, utility call into my into my Cube manifest and get the orchestrator to run that for me. And it's going to exercise as much of the application logic as you need to be confident that your app is actually healthy. So whether that means uh, a combination of the dependency check to make sure your app can reach its dependencies and calling the application to make sure a certain known path is working correctly, it's as much as you want to put in there. But it, it needs to be a balance between running fast because you don't want this, this is going to run inside your container, so you don't want it to slow down any external requests that are coming in, and actually being useful, like exercising some real application logic so you know when the health check passes that your app really is healthy. Okay, like I said, it's almost all demos this session. So, uh, uh, what am I doing here? Java. I'm going back to Java for this one. So, in my Java world, let's close all these things. So, my, again, I've got a health check utility. And all my health checker does, I'll show you this, it's just a little jar file. And what it does is it, it calls the local host. So, because this is going to run inside the container, so I can hard code local host because it just will be local host. Uh, it, it executes a call to the to the uh, the home page, but it expects it to return within a few a few seconds. So it sets the connection timeout, the the request timeout, and the socket timeout all to be a second, and then it's going to look to see if the status code is 200. So I get an OK from my web server, and I get it within 150 milliseconds. Now, this is why the separate utility is useful, because uh, I could do this with a curl script in my Docker file in the health check, or I could use the HTTP check from Kubernetes, but I'm relying on the functionality I get from those things. If I want to go deep and actually check something that's more important for my application, uh, then it's better to have my own, my own utility where I can write whatever code I need in here. So in this case, if I get an OK, but it takes more than 150 milliseconds, then the exit code is zero, which means the health check has failed. I've also, this also needs to be robust because this is going to run every few seconds. So you need to have error handling in here and making sure that, that if, there's a, if there's some sort of unknown exception, um, then you're, you can deal with it correctly. It doesn't take your whole container down, which obviously would defy the point. Okay, so that's my health checker. All it does is check that I get a 200 within 150 milliseconds. And I think I'm on version 4 now. Yes, so version four, uh, I've got my dependency checker, which is the same thing, uh, the same version, uh, same, logically the same thing as I had in .NET. And then I'm copying my health check jar, and I'm specifying the health check. So this is, again, this is, how, this is where Swarm and Kubernetes differ, because in Swarm, you put this in your Docker file. So your image has the, enough knowledge to tell you whether the container is healthy, whereas in Kube, you put that in your manifest, so it's part of your, your deployment, um, your operation, uh, operational deployment. So here I'm saying run every two seconds and run my health checker. So every two seconds it's going to run and it's going to come back and tell me whether it's healthy or not. Now in my compose file, and this is version four. Yeah, so version four, uh, so the compose file for my new Java app, I've got my database, which is just my SQL. I've got the latest version of my Java application, uh, my Java image. It's the same app. It's exactly the same built application, but I'm packaging it up in a different way. I've got all the stuff we've seen so far, so all the configuration files, the dependency check and where all that comes from, a secret for my database connection. And then I've also got, I'm configuring how the health check runs. So these are all default values that live inside the, uh, the, the, the Docker file, but I can override that with my Swarm deployment. So I'm saying if I, a retries of zero, so if I get a single failure, then the, the container's gone bad and Swarm should start a new one. I want it to run every 20 seconds instead of every two seconds and give, it, give the container time to, to warm up. So give it um, 90 seconds to start up before I start running my health checks. Okay, sorry, that was a telephone call, which I've just uh, dismissed. So let's have a look at this. What I've got here, uh, this is where the slow mode business comes in. So uh, inside the code for these applications, there's a little random uh, check, and every one in three occasions or something like that, the app deliberately takes more than 150 milliseconds to respond. So every now and then, it will take 200 milliseconds, and then the health check should fail. It's a really awkward thing to demo because um, sometimes it, it takes ages for that to actually happen. But that's the kind of that's the whole point. When applications fail, it's not deterministic. So you need to be able to make sure that when things fail in an unknown way, um, that things work as expected. Okay, so it's created my database. It's updating my Java web application. 
if I browse back to my, uh, here we go, go back to my services. Uh, okay, so my Java web is, is uh, red at the moment. Okay, so that's cool. So my MySQL database is up and running. My Java web container is zero out of one. Uh, so I've had one that exited five seconds ago. So that is going to be probably to do with the dependency check. So if I have a look at the logs. Yeah, okay, cool. So this is what I said. So sometimes sometimes the database is up and running before the web app runs, or sometimes it isn't. So in this case, uh, the dependency check there tried to connect to MySQL. It failed three times, and then it ended. So, so Docker just started me up a new container. This is the new container. If I look at the logs here, I should see the dependency check way up here somewhere. Dependency, okay. So by the time this container started, its dependencies were available. Okay, so that's running. So if I re rewrite here, so the original container was 65C. I should get a new container name. So I've got a new container. Uh, I've got the same config settings. I've got the same server name and all that sort of stuff. Uh, what I should find, if I let this run long enough, the, the health check will keep calling. And eventually, the health check will hit that random slow response. Like I'm getting a random slow response here. So every 20 seconds, the health check is going to run, and at some point, uh, it will fail the it will fail the health check because it's it returns too slowly, and then uh, it will go uh, unhealthy, and Docker will start me up a replacement. It's an awkward thing to demo because it might happen in the next time I hit the button, or it might happen a little bit later. So what I'll do is, uh, if I can have a volunteer to remember this. <laughs> So CE5 is the current container. I'll come back here during the next demo and we'll see if it's replaced itself. It almost certainly will have done by then. So the health check that's in there is just running every few seconds. It's checking to see that I get a healthy response within the time frame. If it doesn't, it'll respond back to the, to the orchestrator to say it's not healthy. And then the orchestrator will take evasive action. In this case, it'll just replace it with a new container. Uh, and from the .NET world, <coughs> excuse me, exactly the same principle. So in the .NET world, I've got a similar utility, uh, which is the same thing. So it connects to local host. Uh, it makes sure I get a response of OK uh, within 150 milliseconds. Otherwise, I get an exit code of zero. And that's packaged up in the same way. So my probably version 4, version 4. Yeah, I've got my health checker in here. Uh, and then I've got my health check command. So again, by default, it will run every two seconds. So the patterns apply to, to any stack. So Java on Linux, um, .NET on Windows, exactly the same pattern. Okay, and the last one. I've lost all track of time, so sorry if, uh, if I've gone over budget. So the last one is getting metrics out. So um, if you look at the cloud native landscape, uh, if you you know spend ten minutes reading about each of the things on the landscape, uh, it'll take you a while. But but some of the some of the paths that are emerging through there are really useful when you're looking at how to approach problems nowadays. So how to monitor containerized applications. Prometheus and Grafana are pretty much the standard of what people are using. And there's no reason why you can't use the same technologies with your old applications too. So most existing application stacks, whether it's a Windows service or Tomcat that's running as a Java container or uh, any, anything else that's hosting something for you, has already collecting metrics. Like, so your container has already got metrics inside it, but they're in some sort of bespoke format and they're not accessible to the outside world. So this final pattern is about making those metrics endpoints available to something like Prometheus. Again, by using another utility that's going to export whatever metrics are currently in there. So that could be, uh, so in the Windows world, it could be um, Windows performance counters. So Windows collects all these various things and it stores them inside, inside the application container and you just, need to, you just need to pull them out. And the same with Tomcat. Tomcat has its own way of storing uh, lots of different metrics. And all you need to do is have a utility that's going to push them out um, from, your, from, from wherever they're currently stored as a Prometheus endpoint. So this is going to run in the background. It won't use any, uh, any cycles unless it, it's, just, it's just a REST endpoint. It's just a REST API that's exposing the existing metrics in Prometheus format. So unless you're also running Prometheus and it's, and it's actually scraping these containers, having this utility sat there doesn't really add any overhead. So it's a, it's a useful thing to have. But it'll give you your runtime metrics. It won't give you the, the, the really useful low-level stuff that you might care about, like the, what features are being used in your application, because you're going to need to change codes to, to explicitly record those things. 
but it's going to give you the useful stuff about how hard your containers are working. It's going to tell you CPU, request per second from the, from the web server, um, memory usage, all that sort of stuff, which is, uh, it doesn't give you the full picture, but it's pretty useful stuff to have for free because this top point here, the metrics export utility, there's probably already one in the community that you can use for your stack. Okay, so final demo. Let's go back here. Uh, let's see if this has repaired itself. Okay, yeah, so I've got a completely new Java application container. So with, without me doing anything, something went wrong in my old application, in my legacy app. In this case, I had a very slow response. That failed the health check. Docker started a new container. It's just gonna keep, it's gonna keep it up and keep it healthy for me. Okay, so now in my application stack here, so my final Docker file, has got all the existing stuff that we've seen in there. You see the Docker files are getting fairly hefty now, but it's still only about 40 lines, which is actually not much to deploy um, a legacy 10-year-old application from a zip file and make it behave like a modern application. I'm copying, I've got another from line in here. So this is the utility I'm using to export my metrics. This is a sample um, utility that's already packaged as a Docker image. So I can take the exporter application out of there and that's gonna export my Windows uh, performance counters. In the Java world, the equivalent is here. So um, if you want to use the Tomcat exporter, there are a whole bunch of Java files and stuff that you need to download. So I've got that in a separate stage of my Docker file. So I just download all those things from Maven. And then in the application image right at the end, I copy in all the exporter stuff and the war file. So each of my, my, my .NET image and my Java image now have an exporter utility, which is going to um, make my, the metrics inside the container available as a Prometheus endpoint. And then in the startup scripts, those are just running in the background. So uh, actually with, with the Tomcat one, it gets deployed as a Tomcat application. So Tomcat takes care of that for me. And with the .NET one, I start it as a separate application in the background. So this starts before, before the log tailing happens. So now there's lots of things happening in my container. Again, that's not a classic container design where I have a single process in my container. I've now got my application process, my log relay, my metrics, my health check, all those things. But um, that's the way I get my legacy app into the modern world without rewriting it. Okay, so to deploy this, I've got a new Swarm file, a stack file, and I'm running a few other things in here. So this is the .NET version. Again, the, the, the Java version, the same pattern. I've got my database in here. I've got my web application. I've got all the settings that we've talked about up until now. Uh, I've got a uh, the health checks in there. And so this definition hasn't changed apart from the image version that's got my exporter in there. I'm also running Prometheus. So I'm going to run Prometheus. Uh, and it's going to use a configuration file to tell it where to do the scraping. So again, that's, this is a config object that's already in the swarm that I'm surfacing inside Prometheus at the known location, and I've published the port there. This is um, a Linux container. So inside my .NET application stack, I've got SQL Server running in a Windows container. I've got my .NET application in a Windows container, and I'm using Prometheus in a Linux container. And that's fine, because with the overlay networking, that all just works. Um, right now, the, if, you, if you do have hybrid workflows like this with some Windows and some Linux nodes, right now Kubernetes doesn't support that. It's in beta, but it's likely to be uh, GA by the end of the year. So uh, it would just be a Kubernetes manifest describing the same thing, saying this is a, this is a Linux container. It's going to connect to these other Windows containers. Okay, so let's deploy this, which is version 5. So this is going to, um, it's exactly the same principle as doing a kubectl apply. Uh, the stack file is my desired state. Docker compares the desired state with what's currently running and, and makes whatever it needs to be made. Oh, I've got, I've got an error in here. That's me tinkering at the last minute and then not saving nothing. So that should not be there. Okay, so it's going to say uh, Prometheus is a new thing, so it's going to create my Prometheus container, and then it says it's updated my SQL Server, my web application. So now inside my stack, which is my .NET application, I'm going to have three uh, containers running. So let's clear the filter and have a look at my stack. So NetFX, if I look at the services, 
So my web application is still starting up. Uh, my SQL Server is running. My Prometheus is running. Let's go and look at my web containers. So it's the same stack. So I've got a whole bunch of different containers that are running. Uh, this one's just exited. Why is that? Okay, so that's up now. 26 seconds. Create a few seconds ago. Okay, cool. So let's go and browse back to this. Okay, so this is my web forms app. Again, exactly the same. It works in the same way. If I hit refresh a few times, that's going to send some load into the container. The only thing that's different about this application now is it's got an extra endpoint. Uh, which is my Prometheus endpoint. It's not publicly available, so I can't get to it from here, but Prometheus can get to it. And I have exposed Prometheus, uh, the Prometheus container on my load balancer as well. So I'm, I should have said, I'm running up in Azure. Uh, I've got a load, uh, this is Docker Enterprise. I've got load balancers for my Linux nodes and my Windows nodes. And this is my new Prometheus container. So if I look at the configuration, this is the config that's come from uh, the cluster. So it's been ejected into Prometheus, telling it to scrape the .NET web application every five seconds. This is the port that's only available internally to other containers, and that's the metrics path. Uh, let's check my, it's up, so that's good. So it's, it's able to get there. And if I look at the graph, all these things here are stuff that I get for free. So I haven't, just by bundling a community utility which exports these things, these are Windows performance counters, I get them all for free. So stuff telling me request per second uh, is a useful example. If I switch to the graph mode and zoom this down, this is gonna tell me how many requests per second my containers had um, without me having to do anything. It's still my legacy old application. If I had custom performance counters in here or some sort of custom recording, I could surface them in exactly the same way. And it's exactly the same principle for my Java application. So in my Java stack, I've also got Prometheus. Um, the scrape config points it at Java, and it's going to pull out all the stuff that I get from Tomcat, which again is things like CPU, it's request per second, number of active threads. You can really easily build a Grafana dashboard on top of that stuff, and probably import a, a, a default Tomcat um, dashboard to give you everything that you're, that you're interested in. So my legacy app is now giving me metrics as well. Okay, so now my, my old applications are kind of working just like my new applications. So I've filled in all those blanks. I can get logs out. I can get metrics in. I'm checking for dependencies in the orchestrator. I'm telling the orchestrator whether my app is healthy. And I'm also getting metrics out in there. So if I'm, if I'm using, um, if I'm breaking down an, an old legacy monolith into new components and I'm using new technologies for the new bits, then I can have a single dashboard that covers everything. It covers all my brand new Go microservices that's talking to my legacy application. Uh, if I'm using things like um, a cache or a, or a message queue inside containers, I can surface metrics from those two, and I manage everything in exactly the same way. So I've been showing Docker Enterprise. Uh, so it's, it's a, the cluster runs both Swarm and Kubernetes. And you can get to the point where the, the point I talked about right back in the beginning about having a single cluster to run all your workloads. So I can have monolithic .NET and Java applications. If I want to run them on Swarm or Cube, I can choose where to deploy them. I can have my cloud native applications and serverless. There's a whole bunch of serverless frameworks that you just run in containers on your own on your own stack if you don't want to be tied to a particular cloud. So you could uh, this the, the little guy with the with the cape is um, a serverless framework called Nucleo, which is really good. So you can run all that stuff on a single cluster. You manage and work with everything in the same way. Uh, so these are some links uh, if you're interested. So go to trials.docker.com if you want to check out the um, Docker Enterprise, which also gives you Docker Trusted Registry and a bunch of features that I haven't talked about. Um, we've got a couple of video series on YouTube that are more aimed at devs, but if you're interested, um, then there are things to check out. So those Java and .NET videos are about, uh, we call it MTA, Modernizing Traditional Applications. And each of those um, starts with an existing application, shows you how to run it in a container, and then it breaks it down. So it takes features out of the monolith, runs them in separate containers, glues them all together. Uh, if you want to go and check out these demos to check that what I was saying is true, uh, then that link at the bottom will take you there. Uh, I'm on Twitter, Elton Stoneman. I, I tweet about this stuff all the time. If you've got any questions that we don't get to today, feel free to email me. I'm just elton at docker.com. Uh, I hope the connection was good because I've got no view of whether I dropped out an hour ago or not. Um, and I'm happy to hang around and, and answer any questions that you've got. Thank you.
camera on so we show that you are real and you're not a robot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, let me see if I can do that. Awesome, awesome, awesome. We had an absolutely flawless evening. Te uh, Technology-wise, we had a, an absolutely flawless evening in Sydney here. Everything good. Th thank you very much, you guys. Okay, what we might do uh, is just start and see if we've got maybe... Uh, it's getting a little bit late, so we might do a couple of questions from Sydney, a cu couple of questions from Melbourne. So can we start with Sydney? Have we got any, um, any questions for Elsa? Really, really hard ones, because it sounds like he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> and it's really early and he's probably had coffee, so he's probably up for it. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? You must have given... Oh, hang on, we've got one question on the back. Yeah, shut it out. Here we go. I can't really hear you. I don't know if you're talking to me or not. I can't hear you. <laughs> Okay, so if you are running a service on multiple containers, like if you're scaling a service to run on at least two or three containers, then how do you segregate the logs? Like in production, you want to uh, segregate logs that this log is coming from this container or so on. So although the service is one, but since you are running three or four containers, you want to isolate which container is actually throwing the erroneous log. How do you do yeah, that? Yeah. Yeah, good question. And the same. Uh, so the question is, if you're if you're running a service across multiple containers, how do you make sure you know which logs are coming from which container? Uh, and the same question applies actually to metrics. So if I want to see um, CPU usage and um, number of active threads and that sort of stuff, I want I want to be able to aggregate across all the service, but I also want to be able to drill down. Um, and the way you do that is you just include an attribute in your logs or in your metrics to say what the host name is, because the host name is the container ID. So then you can then you can say I've got my log entry everything has a host name as part of my metrics export every line of metric has a host name and then I can use that to correlate back to the containers um, probably more uh, and then it depends on, on whatever you're using to do your, your log scraping so Elasticsearch is going to be pretty easy to just filter by a particular container or roll up and look at all your service logs um, and again Prometheus so I can I can add a label which is my host name which is my container ID for each container. And then each metrics endpoint, I can either aggregate them in Grafana to have a nice overall um, overall usage, or I can I can um, split them by container ID and have and have different lines for each container. So yeah, just by including something like the host name. Awesome. Any other um, any other questions, Sydney? Okay, my, we might pass over to uh, to you, Ben, to see if we can get some questions out of Melbourne. Is what, what do I deal? With, what do I do if I've got? Can you repeat the question, Elton? I'm so sorry. Can you repeat? Or can yeah, you yeah. repeat the question? Yeah, sure. So, so the question, and correct me if I misheard it, the question is, is basically about state. So particularly with, with something like a, a message queue, if you're running message queues in a container, if you have something that's processing a message and then um, it goes unhealthy and the, and the orchestrator kills it and starts up a new one, how do you deal with the fact that that message has been only partially consumed? Well, actually, that's, that's a kind of a broader question about state, but in this particular instance, um, uh, you... Most, most message uh, frameworks, and, and RabbitMQ is no exception, have a way of telling you uh, that the message has been successfully processed. So if I'm in the middle of processing it, Rabbit will know that I haven't had an acknowledgement yet to say it's been done. Um, and then at the end of your processing, you say, I'm done with this. So if you're in the middle of that stack and your container gets killed, then Rabbit won't get the acknowledgement of completion, and it will know that that message needs to be re-delivered to another consumer. Um, the other thing is that, that when, when I say your, your container gets killed, actually what happens depends on... Um, what your container does. So when, when Docker will, will uh, kill a container, it will send, it'll send a signal to the process, and you can, in your, inside your application, you can handle that, that gracefully. So if you get a, a termination signal from, from your orchestrator, you can catch that and you can say, right, I'm, I'm going to be terminated, but I need to finish this first. 
uh, and then you get a grace period of, uh, I don't know, 10 or 20 seconds before you get a kill signal. So uh, the, fir the first thing is your, your application code should be robust enough to allow it to die at any time because, um, you know, having a container restart is, is a, a lot less painful than just having your plug pulled on the server. So you should be able to, you should, if, you're, if you're dealing with messages, you should have an acknowledgement system to say that I've processed it, so it goes off the queue. Um, but then if you, if you are in the middle of a processing loop, um, you should be able to handle the fact that you've got a termination request. Thank you. Okay. Any last questions for Melbourne? Uh, I think that's it. We don't believe you're in Melbourne either, Elton. We can see sun. It looks warm and hot there, and you're in a t-shirt. <laughs> it's not hot, but it's bright. Yeah. yeah. What is all this daylight? It almost looks sunny there, Elton. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong with the camera. Um, yeah. yeah. No, it's. it's I don't know about that. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, round of applause. Thank you very much, Elton. For Streaming in from only the other side of the globe. Thank, thank you very much, sir. And uh, yeah, don't worry, those m millions and millions of pounds will come from Dylan's account. Don't you worry about it. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just to, just to wrap up, uh, just in case uh, anybody doesn't sort of realize, this is not actually a Docker event. Uh, it's an event that's organized by volunteers. Uh, we go under the banner or the disguise of Meetup Madness. Uh, so we've got Ben, Ben's a volunteer, Ben Griffin down in Melbourne, he's a volunteer. I'm a volunteer for putting all this stuff together as well. Um, we, we organize a whole bunch of different events uh, in the automation space, in the data space. Watch, watch that space, by the way. We're about to make some interesting announcements. Uh, and also in the security space as well. So you're interested in DevSecOps, um, automation, security code. Uh, we're, all, we're all over that as well. Uh, so very, very, very complimentary groups. Um, we have for the guys and gals in, in Melbourne, you may have noticed that we're running a, uh, our next big event in Melbourne uh, is the Data Showdown, uh, where we've got a whole bunch of data sets that we, uh, in different domains that we have released um, as a bit of a challenge uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, they were all invited to come back and tell us how, how they were going to change the world. Uh, using the data sets that we have provided. So um, that's going to be a lot of fun in Melbourne. We're going to be running the same event in Sydney uh, early next year as well. So watch this space. Um, who's been to our Beer Ops event? A few hands flapping up in the air. Beer Ops is, happens tw twice a year. It's a networking event. So essentially Sydney's going to have uh, anything up to 400, 450 people, they're all going to crowd into a huge venue. It's a sponsor-driven event as well, which makes all the beer and soft drinks taste that much better, as we all know. Um, it's absolutely awesome, awesome fun, and you really must try and come along if you can. We're just about to announce that uh, for Christmas as well, so watch out for that one. Um, okay, so once again, a, a huge round of applause for our speakers tonight. Um, Elton, Samuel, and Peter, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Whilst your hands are nice and warm, the sponsors, Elmo, thank you very, very much for hosting us very graciously up here in Sydney. Uh, M Melbourne, we've got Microsoft, we've got Docker, we've got uh, the event hosts, all the staff that have given up their time uh, for helping tonight. Um, Ben, ben Griffin, also, uh, doing his awesomeness down in Melbourne as well. Thank, thank you very much, Ben. Uh, and also, as far as Sydney goes, we've had just about every technical problem that has ever been invented tonight. And if it wasn't for the awesomeness of Chris from Cisco, we would not have been able to help um, Elton. A huge round of applause for Chris from Cisco, Cisco and everybody else. Thank you very much. I think we have, we have a... Okay, so what, what we might do now yeah. is we're going to break to Sydney and also to Melbourne. So, Ben, if you'd like to uh, just see if there's anybody down there offline from Sydney, see if there's anybody down there that might be looking for next gig. So a bit of a recruitment slot as value add to the members. And we'll look forward to maybe joining you guys for a bit of a simulcast down in Melbourne maybe next time. Who knows? Th 
Thank you very much, Melbourne. We're going to break and we're going to do the same slot in Sydney. Have a good night.